Okay then, let me sum up what I said last time with one line from uh, Shakespeare. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Those words are spoken by Hamlet's friend Horatio. Hamlet uh, is dying uh, in an act that we will eventually discuss and maybe a kind a form of suicide, but he's very concerned that his name uh, uh, go down in history untarnished, and so he essentially asks Horatio to stay alive and tell a story. And what Horatio says in response to that is, I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Now, what Horatio is saying there is, I'm going to commit suicide. Uh, and he says it by saying, you know, uh, it, uh, I have the spirit of an ancient Roman, and the ancient Romans committed suicide in situations like this. Now, it's very interesting because obviously Horatio is not a couple of thousand years old. He's not an ancient Roman. He is a Dane. He was born in Denmark. He grew up in Denmark, even though he went to school in Germany, uh, college in Germany at Wittenberg. Uh, uh, but he's basically making a point that I'm claiming is fundamental to Shakespeare, uh, that uh, there are differences among regimes, and what you are is a product of the regime you come from. So here's a very fundamental issue, and we will examine it a lot in this course, suicide. Uh, uh, and Shakespeare understands that what your attitude towards suicide is, is not what we today would call a simple personality trait. It's not that some people are suicidal and others are not. It's not that some people are depressed and so prone to suicide and other people are optimistic. The ancient Romans had a fundamentally different attitude towards suicide. You're going to see this all over the place, uh, especially at the end of Julius Caesar where they kind of line up uh, to commit suicide. Uh, you'll see these ancient Romans, they're, they're eager to do it. Uh, for them, it's a matter of honor. There are circumstances in which to continue to live would be disgraceful. And it's very much part of the regime. It's bound up in their political beliefs. It's bound up, obviously, in their religious beliefs. Uh, and by the same token, Christianity forbids suicide. Uh, and, and, and it's, we were going to see Hamlet's fundamental problem. Uh, almost the first thing he says in the play is that the everlasting hath fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. God forbid suicide. You'll see Ophelia cannot be buried in church ground because people think she's committed suicide. Uh, so the, this very fundamental human issue, to be or not to be, to coin a phrase, uh, hinges in many ways on what Plato and Aristotle would call the regime. And the ancient pagans have a very different attitude towards the issue of suicide than modern Christians. You will see Macbeth say, why should I play the Roman fool and die upon mine own sword? And here too, a Shakespearean character saying, I'm not an ancient Roman, so I'm not going to commit suicide. Uh, and so this is what I have in mind, my approach to Shakespeare. Uh, uh, Shakespeare is often offered uh, as a universal genius, uh, as the man with the most comprehensive understanding of the human condition and therefore of human universals. And I would not dispute that, but I'll just modify it in this way, that for Shakespeare, one of the universal principles of humanity is that we all live in particular circumstances. Uh, there is no such thing as the universal human condition simply. And there is a difference between ancient Rome and a modern Christian monarchy. And that to understand human nature, you have to understand those differences of regime. And that's why I'm placing the political uh, at the center uh, of my understanding of Shakespeare in the course. It's not going to limit us. I hope it's going to open up a, a lot of different perspectives. And what I find most remarkable about Shakespeare is his awareness of these differences. This awareness is almost what we can define as the Renaissance. Uh, when you look at medieval paintings of the nativity, for example, there's baby Jesus and the wise man and Mary and snow. You know, it's Bethlehem, December, so these Flemish primitives think, oh, yeah, it must have been snowing, it's December. And so they put snow 
in Bethlehem. That's not to understand the difference in the human condition. What you can put simply as a kind of geographic difference in the human condition. When medieval painters tried to ima imagine the scenes from the life of Jesus, uh, they placed them in something that looked a lot like Bruges or Ghent or some medieval city. Uh, uh, we can see when people do make that error. And my claim is that Shakespeare does not make that error. Now, it is true, you'll see in Julius Caesar, at one point a clock strikes. Uh, and there were no mechanical clocks in ancient Rome. The Roman plebeians have caps in Shakespeare, and they did not in ancient Rome. There are trivial anachronisms like that in Shakespeare's plays. But on an issue like suicide, for example, <laughs> a major ethical issue, he understands how the ancient Romans thought about the issue and how they thought about it differently. And that's the kind of phenomenon we're going to examine in the scores. So, Returning first to the Rome plays, and let me, uh, we've got enough time here for me to give you a good introduction to Rome today and get started on Coriolanus in the course of, of doing so. Again, to uh, repeat and expand a bit what I said last time, Rome loomed very large in Shakespeare's world. It still looms in our world. We have a United States Senate. We're going to be looking at the Roman Senate and Coriolanus. Many of our institutions uh, still have Roman names. A lot of newspapers call themselves the Tribune, the Chicago Tribune, the New York Herald Tribune. A lot of newspapers fashion themselves as speaking up for the people the way the Tribunes did in the ancient Roman Republic. Uh, our, our very vocabulary is, to this day is saturated uh, with Roman concepts. This was even truer in Shakespeare's day. I mean, again, we, we can still appreciate the immense achievement of Rome in so many different areas, but it, it loomed even larger in Shakespeare's day. Uh, uh, in terms of architecture, people had finally just surpassed Roman architecture uh, in, Shakespeare, in the Renaissance. Uh, no dome had been built in Western Europe larger than the dome of uh, Hadrian's Pantheon in Rome until the uh, uh, Cathedral of uh, Florence and Brunelleschi's great achievement with that Duomo. Uh, people were just beginning to surpass Rome. In terms of literature, again, it's hard for us to imagine uh, Greek literature, ancient Greek literature looms more, more in our imagination than ancient Roman literature, I would say. We today respect Homer more than Virgil, generally speaking. But in Shakespeare's day, Greek was, had just been introduced into Western Europe with the fall of Byzantium in 1453. Uh, Shakespeare uh, probably knew the Aeneid in the original Latin. He would not have known Homer um, in the original Greek, the first translations of Homer in English were appearing in Shakespeare's day. Uh, the ancient Roman playwrights, Plautus and Terence, the poets, uh, Virgil, Horace, Catullus, they, they were thought of as the pinnacle of literature. Indeed, it was not until Dante wrote the Divina Commedia, which is around 1300, that people could offer anything in a modern literature that they felt equaled the greatness of Latin literature. It comes as something of a shock to us, but, but uh, uh, as late as the 1590s, uh, people were wondering, is anyone ever going to write great literature in English? You know, okay, Dante's done it in Italian, but people were actually worried about the English language, such an ugly language. Uh, how can you ever write anything great in English? And this is just when Shakespeare is coming along. And indeed, there's a guy, I think his name was Francis Mears, who uh, sometime in the 1590s wrote a piece where he, he kind of showed play by play that Shakespeare's plays could equal some of the achievements uh, uh, of the ancients. So Rome loomed large in so many ways, culturally, linguistically. Uh, again, you could see the grandeur of Roman ruins all over Europe. But above all, Rome's political achievement seemed unprecedented. This vast empire uh, that the Roman Republic had uh, put together and that the Roman Empire uh, uh, had uh, uh, maintained, uh, uh, it seemed extraordinary. 
Uh, there were efforts to imitate it, this strange institution, the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire, which was kind of a loose confederation of German states under the head of an elected emperor. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it seemed almost inconceivable that one country had put together an empire of this size. The Roman roads were still visible. Some of them are still visible today. Some of them are still in use today. There were bridges the ancient Romans built that are still in use today. So uh, this was the beginning of what we think of as the age of empire. Again, Spain uh, was at the pinnacle of its power during Shakespeare's uh, day. Uh, uh, We'll be talking about the Ottoman Empire uh, later in the course when we get to Henry V and especially when we get to Othello. There's no British Empire yet. 1607 (laughs) is the founding of a British colony in Virginia. Uh, uh, But people are thinking empire already. Uh, And when they think empire, they think of Rome. That's why Rome was very much at the center of political discourse in the Renaissance, really at its foundation, and that's why, again, Machiavelli is so important and why I'm having you read the discourses on Libby. So the great question people are asking, and I think Shakespeare's one of them, uh, is why was Rome so great? And that means fundamentally politically and militarily. Uh, And the understanding was it was the Republic that it conquered the world. Now, again, things are a little confusing in this course because of the ambiguity of the term empire. Uh, The Roman Republic created what we call the empire. That is, it's the Roman Republic that conquered most of the territory that went to comprise uh, the, the empire. So we can talk of the empire of the Roman Republic. Uh, the Roman Republic was an imperial power. It went and defeated other imperial powers and emerged, well, as they put it, turned the Mediterranean into a Roman lake. Uh, uh, The other sense of the term Roman Empire is regime or form of government. This Roman Republic eventually turned into an empire. We're going to trace that process in the three plays uh, we're reading. So empire with, with a small e, the Roman Republic had an empire with a small e, the Roman Empire with a large E, that's the change in government from uh, a uh, government in which many people participated in rule to the one-man rule we're going to see emerge under Octavius uh, Caesar. So I'll give you some rough sense of Roman history here. Again, this is not a course in Roman history. Uh, In the famous words, this will not be on the final. We're not going to ask you questions about Roman history and expect you to have Roman dates in mind. And again, I'll stress I'm no expert on Roman history. Some of you probably know more about Roman history than I do. And feel free, in a polite way, to correct me if I'm totally wrong uh, on something. Uh, But I just want to give you a rough sketch of Roman history insofar it bears on these plays. And it wouldn't be the worst thing that ever happened to you to learn something about ancient Rome. If anything, it's, I think, one of the virtues of this course that I think Shakespeare is very useful for us because uh, he was an artist to set out, who set out to represent the real world. And he did a very good job of it. And one of the best ways of studying Rome is to study his Roman plays. But we'll fill in some background to make that a little easier uh, uh, for you. Uh, So to give you the briefest sketch of Roman history, the thing to understand is the the two great eras, the era of the Republic and the Empire, the the Republic is conventionally dated from 509 B.C., uh, the events in Coriolanus are taking place around 494 BC. That's when the tribunes were granted to the people. And the Republic lasted roughly 450 years. Uh, the assassination of Julius Caesar is 44 BC. That's where we're going to make a huge jump from Coriolanus 494 BC to Julius Caesar 44 BC. Uh, 
but in a sense that we're, we're jumping from the moment when the Republic is founded to the beginning of its end when Caesar comes close to one-man rule in Rome and the conspirators try to stop that. Now again, the beginning of the empire, it's a controversial point. Some dated from 31 BC, which is the date of the Battle of Actium, which we'll see at the center of Antony and Cleopatra. Some dated from 27 uh, 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 BC when uh, the Senate granted what amounted to imperial powers to Augustus. You don't have to worry about that. But again, uh, the Republic lasted 450 years, roughly. The Empire then lasted another 450 years or so on. Uh, again, people debate when to date exactly the fall of Rome in the West, but it's sometime around the middle, towards the end of the 5th century uh, AD. Of course, then the Roman, already in 330 AD, they go off to Byzantium and found the, East, found the Eastern Empire. In some sense, the Roman Empire survives till 1453, when uh, Constantinople falls to the Ottoman Turks. Gibbon's famous book, most people think it's the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. It's the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And he traces the Byzantine Empire as a simple con uh, uh, as a con continuation of Rome. Anyway, we're not going to get much past uh, uh, 31 BC in this course. But do understand that roughly uh, two years, 450 to 500 years, uh, the Republican era and the Imperial uh, uh, era. Uh, now, uh, Rome uh, manufactured for itself a mythical history, uh, which pushes its origins back into the 8th century BC. Uh, I mean, if you know Virgil's Aeneid, uh, the Romans manufactured the idea that they were descended from the Trojans. Uh, they wanted to be impressive, and so they create a myth that Trojan refugees had founded Rome. Now, <laughs> Uh, it seems, historically speaking, that criminal refugees founded Rome. Uh, uh, Rome is famous for its seven hills to this day. Uh, the reason people lived on the hills is the rest of the place was a swamp. Uh, well into the 19th century, Rome uh, uh, was a city plagued by malaria. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, and certainly in the earliest days of Rome, uh, you basically had these marshes and people lived up on the hill because the air was halfway decent there. And a lot of Roman history is draining those marshes. Rome had a fantastic sewerage system uh, early in its history and really the founding of Rome has often been traced to the building of the sewers. Uh, but anyway, what I'm getting at is this was not exactly prime real estate when people happened upon it. And it does seem as if this, this community uh, was a refuge that people went to uh, when they had to escape other places. Venice had similar, uh, a similar founding. Again, Venice is still part of a swamp. Uh, and again, uh, areas that people were treated to because no one else wanted them. So the, the origins of Rome are probably pretty low. Uh, and gods probably were not involved. Trojan heroes were probably not involved in the founding. The goddess Venus probably didn't have much to do with it, but that was their myth. But the reality was that it was a kind of a refugee camp. And this is, of course, what toughened up these people. And again, they may, they may basically have been brigands, robbers of some sort. Now, uh, for the immediate background of the period we're looking at, the key thing is to understand that Rome was ruled by the Etruscans. Uh, now, again, this is not something they wanted to popularize in their myths, and they kind of down, downplay the degree. Uh, uh, but this guy, uh, Tarquinius Superbius, Tarquin the Proud, the, the, the king of Rome, who is expelled in the memory of our characters in Coriolanus. He was an Etruscan. Uh, and uh, it's very important for understanding these plays that Rome associate kingship with foreign rule. That as we're heading in to the founding of the Republic here, uh, Rome is ruled by foreign kings. And the expulsion of Tarquin was not just the expulsion of kingship, 
but of foreign rule, of these Etruscan rules. Now, the Etruscans, uh, how many of you have ever looked at anything Etruscan? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a fascinating civilization. Unfortunately, we can't read their writing. So that really limits our knowledge of them. But there's a great deal of Etruscan sculpture, pottery. Their tombs have beautiful wall painting. They're all over Tuscany. Uh, that's more or less where, where uh, Etruria was focused. That is a little northwest of what's Rome. Rome was... Uh, the southern, the more southerly point of Etruscan rule. Uh, they, they had beautiful statuary. If you're in Rome, two great Etruscan museums, the Villa Giulia and then the Vatican has a magnificent uh, 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 collection of Etruscan art. Very beautiful bronzes. So that, for example, the famous Capitoline Wolf, this is the image of the wolf suckling what the Romans called Romulus and Remus. That is almost certainly an Etruscan statue, which the Romans appropriated to Roman mythology. And indeed, Roman architecture began as Etruscan architecture. That temple on the Capitoline Hill, which is no longer there, uh, <laughs> been replaced by something by Michelangelo, so even even trade, but but that original temple of that the Romans called the Temple of Jupiter, that was undoubtedly an Etruscan temple. Uh, so the 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 Romans, of course, like any people, invented a mythology uh, that made them look good. They didn't want to make it clear how derivative they were. Uh, from Etruscan culture, so they kind of played it down. And one thing we're going to be seeing, especially when we get to Julius Caesar, is that the name of king is hated in Rome. You'll see that Caesar toys with the idea of becoming the king of Rome. Uh, Mark Antony, some of you may know, famously offers him a crown, a kingly crown, and Caesar knows he's going too far, that the one thing the Romans will not tolerate is a king. They'll put up with an emperor, as it turns out. Uh, uh, and this is a lesson, by the way, that Machiavelli picked up on. Uh, 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 sometimes just rename a thing and you can get away with it. Uh, but uh, remember, the, the events of Julius Caesar are, four, are more than 450 years after the expulsion of the kings from Rome. But because those were Etruscan kings, uh, the sense that uh, uh, monarchy was not just a bad regime to the Romans, it was a foreign regime. And the hatred of kingship is very much rooted uh, in this historical fact uh, that the Romans, in freeing themselves from uh, kingship, were also freeing themselves from Etruscan rule. Any questions thus far? Okay, again, I will pause periodically. Yes. Well, they, you know, uh, the question is, who were the Etruscans? Uh, I'm repeating this for the uh, TV audience here. Uh, the, uh, they were another people. You know, uh, today we say everyone that lives in Italy is an Itali Italian. In those days, there were dozens of tribes or different peoples living uh, in the area we call, now call Italy. And the Romans eventually defeated them all and created... Uh, a whole out of what's now Italy and indeed defeated just about every other power in the Mediterranean. So I don't know how else to describe them. They were a people. They had their own language, but we don't know what it is. Uh, uh, they had a mythology very similar to Greek and Roman mythology. They had an Athena figure. They had a Venus figure and so on. They probably were actually influenced by the Greeks. One thing most people don't know is for much of Roman history, Greeks lived in what's now the boot of Italy. Southern Italy was, and Sicily were largely Greek uh, uh, during uh, the first three centuries, at least, of the Republic. So there were Greeks living on the Italian peninsula then too. There were, there were the Samnites and all sorts of different people. Uh, and so uh, they did have a very distinctive form of sculpture and pottery and so on. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yes? Um, when you say we yeah. That means like we don't have the means to translate it. Uh, I yes. 
Uh, I don't think there's too much written in Etruscan, which is the problem. Uh, but I know that no one can read Etruscan, uh, and this is very frustrating. Uh, it's very, now, f just as an example, we have a lot of wall paintings, and one thing that's very uh, uh, striking in their wall paintings is women uh, uh, are at banquets with men. Uh, 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 there's a, a form of Etruscan tomb that is man and wife. Uh, women apparently had at least a somewhat higher status in Etruscan society than they did in Greek or ancient Roman society. And that we can tell from, you know, images. Uh, and it's, again, very striking. Uh, but we, there's not a single Etruscan text that I know of. We don't have Etruscan poetry. We don't have the great Etruscan epics or anything like that. Uh, it's very frustrating, but on the other hand, there's a great deal of uh, 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 statuary and wall painting. They painted their tombs uh, very beautifully. Okay, we're, again, we're not reading Shakespeare's Etruscan plays, but there are fascinating people. Uh, and do, again, if you ever get to Rome or Florence, the Florence uh, Archaeology Museum has a wonderful Etruscan collection. The bronzes are extraordinary. Uh, they are, f you know, full-size bronzes, of various deities. Uh, they're, 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 they're almost as good as Greek bronzes. Um, so, uh, where am I? Uh, we're expelling the Tarquins. Okay. So, uh, uh, let's talk now about this Roman regime, the Republican regime, and what made it uh, uh, distinctive. Uh, and the reason Shakespeare was interested in it, and why other people at this time, like Machiavelli, uh, were interested in it, is this regi regime is so potent politically. And above all, it seems to direct human beings towards politics, towards political life. Uh, it's as if you were, you're saying, if you want to see what brings out the political in human beings, check out Rome. Uh, that indeed is why I think Shakespeare devoted so much of his work, uh, his dramatic work, to Rome. Four of his tragedies are actually set in Rome. We're not doing Titus Adronicus for reasons I may eventually go into, but anyway. Four out of his ten tragedies are set in ancient Rome. Uh, so, uh, uh, when uh, the Romans expelled the Etruscan Tarquin kings, uh, they kind of put together on the spot a regime uh, which emerged as what we call the Roman Republic. Now, the Roman Republic was largely an aristocracy. To be honest, it was largely an oligarchy. That is, it was ruled uh, by these nobles, men like Meninius and Cominius and Coriolanus, uh, 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 from families that owned land, that were wealthy. Uh, they were noble in the sense that they were noble warriors. Uh, they were the most prominent uh, men uh, in the community. Uh, and in many ways at the center of the Roman Republic was this institution we call the Senate. So Rome was ruled by a small number of prominent men from noble families. Uh, the, uh, the nasty way of describing it would be it was ruled by a lot of rich people. That's why I say you know, you can, aristocracy means rule of the best. Uh, in many ways, Rome may have been more a plutocracy, rule of the wealthy. Uh, that's certainly the way the plebeians view it in Coriolanus. And Shakespeare allows for that view. But in any case, it's, uh, at the center of the Roman Republic is this Senate. Uh, uh, you're born into these families. These senators are not elected. Uh, as they are in the United States. They, uh, that's the aristocratic principle that being a senator is something you inherit and people had long family lines. You'll see when you get to Julius Caesar, Marcus Brutus is still thinking of himself as a descendant of the Brutus who helped expel the Tarquin kings back in the uh, 5th century BC or the early 6th century BC. Uh, and uh, uh, in that sense, you can call Rome an aristocracy. But the way Rome operated was to create consuls, uh, 
or the institution that we call the consulate. Uh, uh, and so Rome had, in the uh, history of the Republic, two consuls at any given moment. Uh, Coriolanus is trying to become consul uh, in the course of this play. It's the central political issue uh, for him. Uh, and in many ways, this institution uh, goes to the heart of what distinguished the Roman Republic. Uh, these consuls were chosen, in effect nominated uh, by the Senate, uh, and then they, as you see in Coriolanus, they had to pass approval uh, by the plebeians. They were the executive officers of the Republic. And notice the key here, there were always two of them. Here is the hostility to monarchy and one-man rule. Uh, the, the Roman notion was one-man rule is bad. It results in Tarquin the Proud and his son raped a Roman maiden, Lucretius, uh, Lucretia, who then, who then killed herself. Uh, uh, one man rule produces tyranny. We want two man rule. Uh, we don't want to be dependent on only one uh, ruler. Now these consuls uh, 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 could veto each other they, as magistrates, they alternated month by month, and they served only one year. Uh, this, if you will, was the genius of the Roman Republic, uh, especially as Machiavelli understands it. Uh, you need executive rule. Uh, there are situations where someone has to make a decision. Uh, it's a little risky to say <laughs> they both have to agree. Remember, either one can vote, veto the other. But they, you can see they wanted to avoid arbitrary rule, but they still wanted some form of executive rule. And fundamentally, the consuls were military generals. Uh, that's what uh, they had lots of civic functions. They convened the Senate. They presided over the Senate, things like that. But their most <laughs> fundamental role, again, as you can see in Coriolanus, is military. Coriolanus is put up as consul because he's such a great military leader. And that was the idea. This is what Rome needed. Now, again, we got Etruscans, we got Samnites, we got Latins, we got all sorts of crazy people running around Italy, and Rome's got to defend itself, and so they need these uh, uh, great generals. And that's what qualifies you, and that's what you do as consul. And notice the idea here. You got only one year as consul, and you can't succeed. You can be re-elected consul maybe later, but not immediately. So it puts enormous pressure on the consuls to do something fast, to go out and beat somebody, beat the Volskis, beat up on the Etruscans, win some battles so you can become a famous consul. Uh, uh, and so there was a tremendous pressure in the system uh, on the individual consuls to do something big for Rome, and that usually meant do something militarily big, uh, though it could also be some public works project uh, as well. Uh, so the system is set up so that it rewards military excellence. You want to become consul, you've got to prove yourself in battle. You can see that in the story of Coriolanus. Uh, it also puts enormous pressure on the consuls to achieve something fast. And of course, they're in competition with each other uh, in terms of achieving something militarily. Uh, the notion behind the consulate uh, was that Rome wanted to have a large stock of experienced executive leaders. So it would never become too dependent on one man. You can already see in Coriolanus the great fear of becoming too dependent on one man. It's what the tribunes worry about, that everybody's flocking after Coriolanus now. We're going to be back to one-man rule uh, th this way. Uh, and we'll see how S Julius Caesar eventually achieves that by playing the game uh, better than anyone else uh, had. But bas basically, the regime is founded on fear of one-man rule, uh, having this consulate this dual rule as an alternative to this. This was not unique in the ancient world. The Spartans had two executive rulers, so-called ephors, at any given moment. The Roman regime was often compared, the ancient world, to the Spartan regime. Uh, it's an interesting solution to the political problem. Uh, 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 and it 
uh, it both impels individuals to achieve a lot, but it also leaves Rome with alternatives. Uh, at any given moment, there'll be lots of men who have been consul. Uh, uh, Ronald Syme, in his great book on Roman history uh, called The Roman Revolution, I mean, he charts uh, the health of the Roman regime by the number of living ex-consuls. Now, you know, we make a big deal of it when we have a photograph with five living presidents in it. Uh, how many living presidents? Do we have? Anyway, you know, uh, they, they have this picture with Nixon and Carter and Ford. And, you know, well, uh, well, that wouldn't have been enough for Rome. And that's what happens when you have only one man as president and it can serve for four or eight years. You don't have that many people who were president around at any given moment. The Romans pride themselves on, you know, it's sometimes upwards of 25, sometimes 40 uh, men who'd been consul, and you sort of know, well, uh, we, don't, we don't have to do what this consul says, because there's a good backlog of people we can re-elect as consul uh, uh, later. Uh, uh, this is, uh, Machiavelli talks about this at a number of points, uh, uh, but here, this is on page uh, 68 of your edition, it's book one, chapter 30, uh, very important chapter, uh, uh, but he's talking about how the Roman Republic is a model uh, for since the whole city, both the nobles and the ignobles, was put to work in war, so many virtuous men emerged in every age, decorated from various victories, that the people did not have cause to fear any one of them, since they were very many and guarded one another. There were so many virtuous men emerged in every age, decorated from various victories, that the people did not have cause to fear any one of them, since they were very many and guarded one another. That is Machiavelli's understanding, the key to the Roman Republican regime. You can see how Coriolanus is already threatening it in Coriolanus. We will see how Julius Caesar uh, uh, ends this uh, uh, many ruler regime and produces a one ruler regime. So this institution, channels human effort into politics. Uh, uh, it rewards political effort. It rewards it very greatly, and it rewards it for many different people. Uh, 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 it gives you something to strive for. It rewards it. Now, Machiavelli, though, in that passage, stresses nobles and ignobles, and let me say now something on behalf of the plebeians. The... the uh, uh, the nobles, the, the, uh, the men in the Senate, were the, the, they were called the patricians. Uh, but Rome also has this class of the plebeians. They're the first characters we meet in Coriolanus. Uh, they are the poor people of Rome. Uh, they are not slaves. I want to stress that. Rome had slaves, but the plebeians were free people. They were, in, in many cases, freed slaves, uh, but basically they were poor people. They were the tradesmen, the farmers, uh, you know, like a cobbler, a shoemaker, uh, people like that. Uh, 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 the patricians, by and large, were the landowners. Uh, the plebeians were, by and large, people who didn't own land. Now, by the way, these, what I'm saying largely characterizes the early republic. Again, it had... 450 years of history. Over the centuries, the plebeians, individual plebeians became very wealthy, and you had the paradox of extremely wealthy poor people. Uh, uh, but do understand, the original beginning, it's, it, as you see it in Coriolanus, the distinction between patricians and patri uh, plebeians is the distinction between uh, rich and poor people, and especially the distinction between landed wealth and a kind of urban populace who are engaged uh, in the various trades. Uh, uh, but the plebeians uh, have a role in the government, too. Uh, uh, and that, too, according to Machiavelli, is part of the genius of the Roman Republic. Uh, for example, uh, they get to pass on the men, in effect, nominated by the Senate to be consul. And as we see in Coriolanus, uh, he blows it, and if you don't treat the plebeians with at least a minimum of respect, you will not get to be consul. This means that the plebeians uh, have a say in the regime. Uh, and, of course, they then get this institution of the tribunate, uh, 
which gives them even a more, more of a say. They get their own representatives, uh, these tribunes. The tribunes, again, it's very, very complicated, the exact details of it, but the tribunes uh, could, uh, on their own, convene the Senate. They could overrule, they could veto the actions of Roman magistrates. Basically, they became the defenders of the people. If a person, if a plebeian was uh, treated unjustly, uh, a tribune could intervene on his behalf. Again, that's why American newspapers started calling themselves the Tribune, because they saw their role as defending the common people uh, of America. So, yes? Who were the tribunes? They were initial, initially plebeians. For much of the history of Rome, a patrician could not become tribune, and a plebeian could not become consul. Over hundreds of years, that changed, and it's one of the ways in which the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Roman Republic was corrupted uh, when uh, <coughs> plebeians were eligible to become consul, and in some ways, even more uh, when the, the uh, 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 patricians were able to become tributes. Uh, just to jump ahead a bit, and we, we won't look at this in Shakespeare, but Octavius Caesar, this man who became Augustus Caesar, one of his great tricks was having himself made tribune, uh, uh, which sounds like, you know, why would this great patrician want to be tribune? But then he could veto things that other aristocrats did, and so one of the, tr the Roman emperor to some extent, emerged through using the tribunal power. Uh, but again, at the beginning, again, we're talking about a 450-year history, so it's very complicated. But in the period we're looking at, which is really the beginning of all this, only patricians can be consuls, only plebeians can be tribunes. But that's an excellent question. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, so uh, what we're looking at here is participation in politics. What's characteristic of this Republican regime is the way it allows uh, everybody uh, to participate in, in Roman politics. Now, of course, that does not mean slaves, and let's never forget that this was a slaveholding society. It does not seem to mean women, although Shakespeare shows women very prominent in these plays and very prominent in the operation of Rome, and Volumnia being a good example of that. So uh, technically, women couldn't be consul or be, be tribune, and I, we, we shouldn't forget that. Uh, but but uh, so in a way, when I'm talking about full participation here, I'm talking about the men in ancient Rome. But in any case, uh, uh, what you s see here is, it's not democracy in the modern sense. Uh, the Roman plebeians, uh, after all, they have a very limited choice. They can't elect one of their own. Uh, they're dependent very much on who the Senate puts up for consul. Still, there's some sense that they have a say in it, and the tribunes give them more of a say of it. Uh, what I'm looking at here is a system in which every Roman has some stake in the regime. Again, it's not democratic. They don't have an equal stake in the regime. Uh, uh, a lot of people talk about Coriolanus as if it portrays a democracy, and that's not at all true. It portrays a regime with a democratic element. In fact, uh, uh, the Roman regime was famously understood in the ancient world uh, as a mixed regime, uh, this idea that you can find in Aristotle's politics. Uh, uh, that is, uh, and there's a, uh, a Greek historian named Polybius, who wrote the most famous account uh, of the Roman regime in antiquity. And uh, uh, the way he put it, he said, if you looked at this, and Machiavelli picks up on this in the discourses, if you look at the Senate, you would think Rome was an aristocracy. If you look at the consuls, you would think it was a monarchy. If you looked at the tribunate, you'd think it was a democracy. But the point was, no, it has elements of all three uh, regimes, uh, it's a mixed regime, therefore it's superior. See, this is, again, this is interesting, if you know, how many of you know Plato's Republic? 
good sign. Uh, you might take a look at that in the course of the semester uh, if you have a chance. Uh, famously, the sequence of regimes in that, uh, that monarchy degenerates into tyranny, and uh, then you get aristocracy, and aristocracy degenerates into oligarchy, and then you get democracy, and that degenerates into marble rule. The, the pure regimes, one man rule, many man rule, all men rule, uh, they were seen as unstable. And one of the ideas was a mixed regime uh, might supply the stability lacking. Uh, and that's, Sparta was an example of that in ancient thinking. And Rome was held up as a model because it seemed to solve this problem of the degeneration of regimes uh, because it had an element of each. It, in, it had an element of aristocracy, it had an element of monarchy, it had an element of democracy. Uh, Rome is uh, a good example of uh, checks and balances and separation of powers. It's why People like Montesquieu thought so much in terms of Rome. It's why the founding fathers, as you can see in the Federalist Papers, were thinking so much in terms of Rome. These ideas of, again, separation of powers, checks and balances, uh, they seem to be worked out in terms of this Roman regime. Again, people are trying to figure out why did this, what started out as a little group of robbers in a swamp, end up conquering the whole of the Mediterranean world? And they looked at this regime and it had a certain functioning uh, 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 power. Uh, and Shakespeare seems to understand that. He, he has all these institutions. Indeed, he shows the founding uh, of the tribunes here uh, in this play. Any questions about that thus far? OK, let me go now a little bit more into Shakespeare's analysis of these parties in Rome, uh, the patricians uh, and the plebeians uh, and their relations. Uh, now, again, the patricians are what we think of as the nobles. Uh, they manifest themselves fundamentally as noble warriors. Uh, Coriolanus seems to be the one they most uh, look up to. If you look at page 51, uh, in the great speech that uh, Comitius gives in praise of Coriolanus. This is Act 2, Scene 2, about line 85. <clears throat> it is held that valor is the chief def chiefest virtue. And there you have it. I mean, this is a community in which valor is held to be the chiefest virtue. That is not true of all communities. Uh, uh, I, uh, I would be very surprised to hear an American politician get up and say that valor uh, is the chiefest virtue in the United States, as opposed to, say, compassion. Uh, uh, politician would have a lot of problems making that claim, uh, unless it was at a military funeral, which is this is close to being here. Uh, but it says something about this Roman community that 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 it looks up to its soldiers as the peak of humanity. It's one reason it produces men uh, like Coriolanus. Uh, they're courageous, they're almost fearless, they're almost foolhardy, uh, as uh, we see here. Uh, and they're dominated by quality, uh, I'll call uh, spiritedness. It's a translation uh, of a Greek word we need to know to understand Shakespeare's Romans, thumas. How many of you have ever seen that term? <laughs> Okay, we got one uh, here. Uh, this is, I'm now uh, using Plato's Republic here to understand Shakespeare's own plays, the psychology of uh, uh, the, uh, the understanding of the soul that Shakespeare presents, excuse me, that Plato presents in, in the Republic. Uh, the Republic talks about three parts of the soul. One is reason, the rational faculty. What is Thumas? The other is eros. Now, how many of you have seen that word? Aha. <laughs> this is the problem with our modern world. We, under <laughs> we understand eros, but not thumos. Uh, now, uh, I can contrast the two uh, and define them that way. Uh, eros is desire. It's the desiring part of the soul. It's our appetites. Uh, it's our sexual desire. It's our desire for food. It's all the things that we want all the things that we desire, the erotic component of the soul, very strong part of the soul. Thumas, and again, I'm going to try to I'll use the word spiritedness uh, to uh, uh, translate it. Uh, that's the part of the soul uh, uh, that makes people courageous, 
uh, that makes them get angry, that makes them get indignant over things. Uh, it's what soldiers feel in battle. It's what athletes feel in competition. Uh, it's also irrational, like Eros, because it sometimes makes us do crazy things, like go into a battle. <laughs> and stay there, uh, or run a marathon till we fall over dead at the end. That's, that's Thumas for you. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the ways you can understand Thumas is, is the part of the soul that counters Eros. Uh, we have desires, very powerful desires, but sometimes uh, people uh, 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 negate their desires. Now, sometimes that's because rationally they decide to control their uh, desires, but sometimes it's quite different. Look at page 100 in Coriolanus. This is the end of Act 4, Scene 2. It's page 100, about line 50. Uh, 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 Meninius says to Volumnia, you'll sup with me? And she replies, anger is my meat. I sup upon myself, and so shall starve with feeding. That's Thumas. Notice, by the way, a woman has it. Uh, there's a certain connection between Thumas and a lot of activities we associate with men, like battle and athletics, uh, but there are now women warriors, and there's certainly a lot of women athletes, and uh, Thumas uh, can appear in women just as in men, and Shakespeare makes, has, has very Thumatic women among his Roman women. And here's her point, angers my meat. Uh, she's going to starve with feeding. She rejects this, what we think of as this very human desire. Uh, uh, eat. Enjoy yourself. Have some fun. She rejects it because she's indignant. Uh, and notice she's indignant over a political matter. Her son has been mistreated. He has been politically mistreated. And Thumas is very important in Plato. It's very important in Shakespeare because it's the part of the human soul that attaches people to causes. Uh, at its best or its most useful, Thumas becomes public spiritedness. It's what gets people attached to political causes. And again, people actually react irrationally uh, in politics. You just have to look at some of these convention demonstrations to understand that. Uh, that's Thumas manifesting itself. Uh, that is, uh, 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 that's why politics is so frequently characterized by indignation and anger. Indignation over injustice. Again, Thumas is at its best or its most useful when people get angry over unjust things. Uh, and it's very, uh, again, Shakespeare doesn't use the word, though he does use the word spirit quite a bit. Uh, 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 it is the sense what, what makes these Romans so political is their spiritedness and all the institutions they have that direct spiritedness towards politics. Uh, in some ways, the whole Roman Republic is set up so the channel of the Thumas of its men and some of its women uh, in political uh, directions. Now, again, this is a very uh, 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 interesting contrast uh, in the play. Uh, uh, if you look at 125, uh, with, this is uh, uh, Act 5, Scene 1, Menendez's speech about going to see Coriolanus. This is when he's going to try to persuade him not to destroy Rome. What he says seems so odd. Uh, this is line 50 in Act 5, Scene 1. Uh, he was not, he, he's trying to explain to himself why Cominius, Coriolanus' old friend, wouldn't listen to him. He was not taken well. He had not dined. The veins unfilled, our blood is cold. And then we pout upon the morning are an apt to give or to forgive. But when we have stuffed these pipes and these conveyances of our blood with wine and feeding, we have suppler souls than in our priest-like fast. Therefore, I'll watch him till he be dieted to my request, and then I'll set upon him. Uh, and he's, this really uh, sticks with him when he shows up uh, uh, at the Volskian camp. This is the top of page 128. Act 5, scene 2, about line 35. He asked the soldiers, has he dined? Canst thou tell? For I would not speak with him till after dinner. Now, Menenius should have learned a lesson from Coriolanus' mother, from Volumnia, who says, anger is my meat. 
like mother, like son, Coriolanus is chock full of thumos. And so you're not going to solve your problem by uh, having a nice dinner with him and serving him wine. Uh, this is uh, that's why I say this platonic psychology is actually stands behind uh, uh, Shakespeare's Roman plays, especially Coriolanus. He really does understand characters in terms of whether eros prevails in them or thumos prevails in them. Uh, and the thumotic characters are the warriors. Now, well, any questions about that? Yes. You said there were three parts of oh, oh, yeah. Logos. Reason, yeah. <laughs> no wonder you forgot that. Yeah, in part, the, the three parts of the soul are reason or logos, uh, eros and thumos. By the way, in the Greek, Shakespeare does not, Plato does not use the words eros and thumos. It's epithabia and thumoides, but don't, don't worry about that. I mean, these are just words that make it somewhat clearer and closer to modern English. Okay, now, let me uh, show you how this applies to Rome. It would be very tempting to say that the plebeians are the party of Eros and the patricians are the party of Thumos in Rome. And uh, in some ways, that is largely true, but it's ultimately untrue, and I'll correct it. But let's start with the, uh, the false generalization. That is, generally speaking, the plebeians seem to be the character, characters who are interested in their desires. Uh, when we see them at the beginning of the play, they're complaining about a dearth, uh, a famine, that they don't have enough grain. Uh, cor they say corn at that time meant grain. It, it was a general term for grain. Uh, it wasn't what we now call corn. But and they didn't have our corn in ancient Rome, and they didn't even have it in Shakespeare's England. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're, they're really interested in food. Uh, uh, and they, uh, uh, when they serve in the army, they're very prone to loot. They like to pick up stuff after the battle. They're very acquisitive or appetitive. Uh, and, of course, it's the patricians who seem to be the party of Thumos in the city. In some ways, Coriolanus is their highest representative. The patricians think of themselves as warriors, uh, as courageous men who ride off into battle and do courageous and even foolhardy things like try to conquer a city single-handedly. Uh, uh, and so, in some ways, the conflict between patricians and plebeians in the play is the conflict between the spirited, thumatic nobles and these erotic plebeians. But I just cited Menenius as an erotic character. Uh, Menenius uh, is the one who's so worried about eating uh, and so worried about whether the body is well fed. And of course, it's Menenius who tells the fable of the belly in the story, which portrays the Senate, in a sense, in very physical, uh, almost physiological terms, that the Senate is where all the food uh, ends up. And this is the uh, subtle aspect of the play that I think, uh, it's one way in which I think Shakespeare is very insightful as his understanding of the Roman regime. You can see... Uh, the uh, uh, point, I think, best on pages 38 and 39. So this would be Act 2, Scene 1 uh, of Coriolanus. Now let me stress, first of all, that this is a conversation between Menenius the Patrician and Sicinius and Brutus the Tribunes and therefore Plebeians. Uh, and this is a very important scene because in a way, we see how the Republican regime functions here. In a sense, we see what greases the wheels of the Roman Republic here. And it is the fact that at least one patrician can sit down and talk to a couple of plebeians. Uh, you're not going to see this again uh, in Julius Caesar or Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, it is a feature of the early Republic that this kind of conversation can take place. And in political terms, it's a healthy 
conversation, it means that patricians and plebeians, despite their differences, can communicate and in some ways deliberate. Uh, and in particular, as we see in this scene, may try to arise, arrive at some kind of compromise. Now, what's interesting uh, is that here, the natures of the characters cut across what appear to be their party divisions. That is, look at the top of page 39. This is uh, about line 47. Menendius says of himself, I am known to be a humorous patrician and one that loves a cup of hot wine with not a drop of a laying Tiber in it. Again, when he goes to define himself, it's in terms of his appetites. By the way, as you may know, the ancients diluted their wine. They mixed it with water. And they didn't even have distilled liquor. So, I mean, they're diluting alcoholic beverages that are maybe 12% alcohol to begin with. So when you read about these great drunken orgies in the ancient world, nothing compared to the modern world uh, with, <laughs> with 100 proof scotch uh, uh, <laughs> without ice. Uh, uh, but anyway, so, so but, but he, doesn't, he, he doesn't dilute his wine. Uh, uh, but how curious, he is a patrician member of what we think is the party of Thumos, and yet he speaks of himself in, uh, in terms of Eros. And then look what he says of Sicinius and Brutus. Line 69, I'm still on page 39. Uh, you know neither me, yourselves, nor anything. You are ambitious for poor days, caps, and legs. Uh, now, he's trying to demean their ambitions here, but it still means they're ambitious. That's Thumos. Uh, again, what makes people ambitious is that thumos. You know, it's when you beat your chest. The, the ancient Greeks imagined thumos as right in the chest. Uh, actually, in some ways, the best translation of the word would be heart or especially guts. Uh, the, the ancient Greeks, particularly, you see this in Homer, had the sense whatever this thumos is, it's inside your chest, and it boils over. It wants to get out in anger. You know, when you, when you draw a line in the sand, say, step over that line, that's thumos speaking. And these plebeians are thumotic. They're pint-sized thumotic, according to Meninius, but they are ambitious. Now, it seems to me this is very subtle on Shakespeare's part, and shows, in a sense, how this Roman regime functions. It's a mixed regime in another sense, that the parties are internally mixed. That is, if you had a pure party of Eros and a pure party of Thumos, they could never speak to each other. Uh, the erotic people would be so concerned with their appetites, they'd never risk their lives in battle. Uh, the Thumotic people would be so concerned with glory and winning battles that like Coriolanus, they wouldn't worry uh, about life and limb. Like Volumnia, they wouldn't bother eating. Achilles is the great image of Thumos in ancient Greek literature. And, uh, you see, uh, his wrath, his anger is the great, his Thumos is the great theme of the Iliad. By the way, Thumos is a Homeric word. It appears all over uh, uh, the Iliad, the Odyssey. There's a great little dialogue between uh, uh, Odysseus and his Thumos when he comes home uh, and is about to fight the suitors. He, he's thinking it out. He has a little dialogue with his Thumos, how to handle it, uh, not to let it go completely and do something crazy. Anyway, uh, what you see here is there are, as it were, Thumonic members of the erotic party the tribunes among the plebeians, and there are erotic members among the Thumotic party, the patricians, like Meninius, and that's where the dialogue occurs, by the outliers in the party. It's, I think this is very subtle on Shakespeare's part, that the Thumotic men among the plebeians can talk to the erotic men among the patricians. Uh, and again, without that dialogue, the Roman regime is simply at odds. Uh, with each other. So we get a situation here uh, where, uh, in a way, it's lucky that the parties aren't rationally organized, uh, that we didn't say, all thematic guys get over here, all erotic guys get over here, because then we'd have an uh, unbridgeable gulf between them. Now, uh, on that same page, 39, it is interesting, in line 55, uh, uh, Meninius says to the uh, tribunes, I cannot call you Lycurguses. Anybody know who Lycurgus was? What? Uh, 
Yeah, he was the, the, the lawgiver, the founder of Sparta. Uh, and it is interesting that Shakespeare brings that name up here because uh, what we see in this play is, in a sense, the fundamental difference between Sparta and Rome, uh, that Rome has no lawgiver. It has no Lycurgus, uh, uh, the way Sparta did. Uh, now, Sparta was famous uh, for having this regime laid out by Lycurgus, this constitution, in a way, spelled out. And it was a mixed regime, in fact. And it was, uh, again, Sparta was militarily very successful, and the regime lasted for a long time. Uh, what struck people already in antiquity, and what especially struck Machiavelli, is that Rome managed to have a mixed regime without a Lycurgus. Uh, now, again, there's all these legends of the founding of Rome. Did Aeneas found Rome? Did Romulus found Rome? Kind of sounds, sounds like it from the name of the city, but that's all legend. Uh, uh, and in fact, what Shakespeare portrays in this play uh, is the truth about the founding of Rome, namely that the regime was jerry-built. It was thrown together without planning. Uh, that it involved a number of spur-of-the-moment decisions. There was not a constitutional convention after the expulsion of the Tarquin kings and an attempt to sit down uh, and write out a constitution. Indeed, Rome did not have a written constitution. Uh, and indeed, the constitution... Uh, by the way, con this Greek word politeia, from which we get the word regime, can also be translated constitution. The Roman constitution changed over the centuries, and it was always in response to events. Uh, can you see here, the patricians are not really thinking through the creation of the tribunate. There's a, r a riot. Rome's faced with foreign problems. Uh, the prospect of war, they feel they got to get the plebeians back in line. And so they grant them uh, this uh, institution of tribunes. Notice a very interesting aspect of it. The plebeians begin rioting for food, and they accept a political institution in place of it. it does show that uh, there's thumos in all these plebeians. In some ways, they're more concerned about their dignity than their bellies. Uh, that something that gives them a stake in the regime, like the tribune, that does answer uh, to what's upsetting them. So uh, it was very clear to people in thinking about Rome that it did not have the kind of carefully planned regime uh, that Sparta did with a single founder who laid out a constitution. This, in fact from Machiavelli's point of view, was the strength of the Roman constitution, that it responded to events, it changed, it was adaptable, and that's one of the reasons Rome survived uh, for so long. And indeed, as I've already mentioned, you know, after several centuries, uh, plebeians could become consuls. Uh, you know, imagine if Rome had a written constitution that said no plebeian could ever become consul. Fundamental, what looked like fundamental Roman institutions changed and the Republic still prevailed. Now, by the way, the fable of the belly points in this direction. Uh, <laughs> I just, I don't know about this diagram here. Logos is my office phone, Eros is my phone number, and Thumos is my email address. I don't, I don't quite mean to put it that way, but, but in term, this, this diagram is pretty good in terms of understanding Plato, that in Plato, Logos is above Eros and Thumos. Uh, Logos, reason, uh, is supposed to control uh, the two irrational forms of passion. Uh, uh, so that in Plato... Uh, the head, reason, rules over the body and its passions. It's very odd that Menenius offers this fable of the belly. Uh, it shows something about him, it shows something about the Senate, it shows something about Rome. Now, the fable is in Shakespeare's source. Uh, Shakespeare did not make this up. It's right there in Plutarch's Life of Coriolanus. You can see in the back of your signet edition. Uh, for that matter, 
Uh, it's in uh, Livy's History of Rome. Shakespeare had several sources of this fable, more elaborate ones that he seems to have drawn upon because the account in Plutarch is uh, very brief in the fable of Belly. Uh, uh, so it's not as if Shakespeare made this up himself, but he does dwell on it uh, at uh, length, uh, uh, and it, uh, it does seem to be uh, a very strange <laughs> image of politics. You would think uh, that in an image of who rules in the body, it wouldn't be the belly. It would somehow be the head or maybe the heart. Uh, the, some of the plebeians inadvertently uh, offer that. Uh, but from the beginning, we see in uh, Shakespeare's portrait of Rome uh, that Logos is not exactly the ruling power in the Roman Republic. Uh, uh, that in fact, we've got uh, a city in which Eros and Thumos jostle against each other uh, and in which the institutionalization of the uh, passions uh, uh, is what makes them work, not a single governing principle uh, of reason. No philosopher kings in Shakespeare's Rome, that's not surprising. But again, it's worth noting uh, that there isn't even a philosopher king at the founding of this Rome. There isn't a, a rational planning of this regime. We would say it evolves over time. Yes? Yeah. But I guess my I'm curious as to how you would differentiate the, the desire that you could say is also associated with ambition, desire to excel, succeed, etc., with the desire of error. Yeah. You see, well, again, this is a matter of semantics. Uh, I would try not to say the desire to rule. Uh, I would try to say the ambition to rule to keep the two things uh, uh, separate. Now, it's complicated. Uh, and I mean, I've, you know, I've drawn these lines and I've blurted them in many cases already. Uh, many people are ambitious to rule for the erotic benefits thereof. That is, all the things you can get once you're a ruler. And this was very strong in the ancient understanding of tyranny, for example. Uh, that the tyrant was the guy who could sleep with anybody in the city. Oedipus being the most famous example thereof. And remember, that play is called Oedipus Tyrannos uh, in Greek. Uh, so uh, it, it gets a little complicated because you can say uh, in many people that there's an ambition uh, that really is rooted in eros because what they, what they really want is the things that come with rule. On the other hand, there is a pure form of ambition, which you see in people like Coriolanus who say, I don't want the spoils from the battle. You know, I don't want to have a big banquet. I just want honor. And so, uh, again, our language can get a little confusing on this. Uh, and the phenomenon itself can be confusing. Let's face it, there, you know, probably there aren't examples of pure eros and pure thumos, and that, that uh, uh, especially a lot of people are ambitious for the desires they can still fulfill. Does, does that help you with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it's, it's largely a question of which words you use. Yes? How about the love of patriotism? OK. Uh, uh, that's Thumas. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, because the other kind of love of the fatherland <laughs> takes a long time. Uh, but uh, that is, yeah, the idea uh, that uh, you love your fatherland, you know, its fundamental manifestation is you will fight for it. It's the classic case of drawing the line in the sand. Uh, and it's my country right and wrong and all, all those things as well. Uh, 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 it's not an erotic love. Now, again, we, you know, Greek, it, it, you could call it philia in Greek. There's another Greek word that's different that, uh, that isn't love in the sense of physical desire. Uh, <laughs> they're... they're I guess the way, I mean, the purest sense, love of the fatherland is, ero, is not eros because you don't wish to mate with your fatherland. The reason I bring it up yeah. is that that's the word that's used in, in Pericles' oration. Yeah, I wonder which word it used in Greek, though. Is it, it is, is it? Yeah, so oh, it that's interesting. Love, you know, is it yeah. Yeah. Love, uh, yeah. Their yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not quite in the play. In the yeah, yeah. Again, I, uh, uh, 
you know, I, the way I would try to draw the line is to say that love of the farmland isn't a desire to mate with it, but maybe Pericles had something else in mind. I guess, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that's a good piece. There's a real connection between Eros and the desire for some form of immortality. Okay, I mean, again, these are very complicated issues, and mere words are kind of just counters in understanding this. Uh, but in general, uh, patriotism is one of the clear expressions of thumos, and the goal of most regimes is to attach their citizens' thumos to love of the fatherland uh, and, and to fight for it. Uh, very good. Is that another? Yes, question. Uh, not quite. Now, that's getting a little too philosophical. If, if I could, maybe we could talk after class about that. Because so uh, uh, there are, uh, in my view, both of these have connections to the ideas. But that's a, that's a, that's going beyond what we need to do in this in this class. I'm afraid. Uh, uh, okay, let me just try to finish up on this point. Uh, so. Uh, again, in a classic Platonic understanding of the regime, you would have Logos ruling over Eros and Thumos. In, in Shakespeare's Rome or Machiavelli's Rome, you do not. Uh, the most you do is try to have institutions that can channel these irrational parts of the soul, which are necessarily parts of human nature, in ways that are politically efficacious or at least not politically catastrophic. Here's a way, Shakespeare illustrates this, in the difference between the Volskys uh, and the uh, Romans. Uh, uh, at first, you know, Coriolanus objects to the creation of the tribunate. Uh, he sees it as introducing an irrational element in the regime. And it doesn't work out too well for him. But it sure works out worse for him in a country that doesn't have tribunes. Uh, that is, when he goes to the Volskys, uh, uh, it's one of the ironies that the play will talk about, that he claims to be going to a world elsewhere. In many ways, he goes to a world that's a mirror image of the Roman left. And what he finds there is just what he found in Rome, an ang angry mob that hates him, and they tear him to pieces. Uh, uh, because there are no tribunes. Uh, it's not as simple as that. It really does not help to be Coriolanus and Corioli, it turns out. Uh, but, but uh, you know, it's an interesting fact that the anger of the mob in Rome is channeled in some ways through a political institution, through having this tribunate, which for one thing allows the ambitious men among the plebeians to have an office they can aspire to, which allows them to direct uh, the mob's fury. In some ways, they misdirected. They create a lot of problems for Rome. But still, there's a sense of some element of institutional channeling of this irrational part of the soul. Whereas in, in, uh, in the land of the Volskis, for all its similarities to Rome, it has senators, for example. Uh, they do not have tribunes, and in some ways, uh, you see the danger of that. Uh, uh, Rome is, yeah, it, it doesn't have philosopher kings, it doesn't try to educate its citizens uh, into philosopher, philosophers. Uh, in many ways, it just uh, lets them have their irrational emotions. But it do, the regime does try to channel them in some kind of uh, institutional way. It's very, uh, uh, again, Shakespeare's sources are clear using Plutarch's life of Coriolanus. And uh, as some of you may know, Plutarch's lives are often called the parallel lives. And what he does is pair a Greek and a Roman. Plutarch was a Greek historian writing under Roman rule. Uh, and he rather cleverly always makes his Greeks look better than his Romans in his lives. And it's interesting that the parallel life to Coriolanus uh, uh, is the life of Alcibiades. Uh, and we don't have time to go too much into Alcibiades, though we may refer to him. But it, as some of you may know, uh, well, Plato wrote a dialogue called the Alcibiades, uh, and uh, Alcibiades was the pupil of Socrates. And so it is interesting, at parallel points in these parallel lives, where Plutarch stresses that Coriolanus lacked an education, 
And by the way, notice he, he has no father. Uh, Meninius is the best he has. Uh, we're told several times in the play he was just bred for the wars, where, where uh, Plutarch stresses uh, the minimal character of Coriolanus' education. We got Alcibiades in the parallel life being taught by no less than Socrates. Now, that didn't work out so great in terms of Alcibiades' life, if you know about him, but it, it does perhaps point to some of the differences between ancient Rome and ancient Greece, which Shakespeare uh, may have had in mind. So, just to sum up, and we'll, we'll, we'll end here, uh, I'll take a final question or so, but, but uh, what we've been seeing here is the ways in which this Roman regime uh, draws upon human nature, uh, the impulses in human nature, and channels them in political directions, indeed tries to get them uh, to work in positive ways uh, for the city. That's why Rome turns out to be so political, why political life dominates in the city, and why the political life of the city generates this particular form of greatness, which is martial greatness, military greatness, channeling uh, the, the souls of its citizens uh, in the direction of military conquest. Okay, I'll t any final questions? Okay, we'll stop here.